Welcome, everyone, and thank you for getting back on time. We're running a little bit late. My apologies. I was caught up in a meeting thinking about where we should be holding interest in the future. So you'll hear more about that tomorrow. Uh, my name is Kate Hankins, and I have the honor to chair this session, Addressing COVID-19 Setbacks Among Women Professionals Supporting Gender-Sensitive Resilient Strategies. We have three panelists, uh, Linda Gale Becker, who's joining us online. Uh, we were supposed to have Pauline um, Bakikikabuika, but she can't be here, so Sabrina, our local co-chair, is going to step in. And we have uh, Rhoda Wanzenze, do you say this, Wanyenze? <laughs> who is the Dean of the School of Public Health at Macquarie University. We were intended to have a fourth panelist who would be from the European and Developing Countries Clinical Trials Partnership. And I'll just speak a little bit about EDCTP and what it has done on this particular issue. So the first thing that a funder can do is to track the indicators of how many women actually are coordinators and principal investigators of funded grants, how many fellowships, uh, career awards, and so on. What's the gender balance in clinical trial leadership? And beyond the career grants, what happens in terms of the peer review committees? How many women are sitting on the peer review committees? How many women are invited actually to the meetings, the peer review meetings? These are just basic things we need to do to start to track what's going on. And then to raise awareness among uh, people who are reviewing grants and reviewing proposals for scholarships and fellowships about gaps in careers because it's still the case that women are more likely to take maternity leave than paternity leave. So a 35-year-old man may have one or two more publications than a 35-year-old woman. And so we have to take into account those career gaps when we're assessing in a competition who should be getting scholarships going forward. The other thing that has to happen is to remove the barriers to recruitment retention and the career progression of women. So how can you address the gender imbalances in decision-making processes about who gets promoted in academia, who gets to get that leg up to move forward? So I just want to say that EDCTP, I have the honor of chairing the Scientific Advisory Committee for EDCTP. It really wants to ensure gender balance in all EDCTP activities. So you will hear at the next interest, I think you'll hear more from EDCTP. Today in particular, we want to look at the impact of COVID-19 and what it's had on women researchers, clinicians, scientists, professionals, because what we saw again was with lockdowns and so on, that women took on added responsibilities and ended up juggling many different balls. <laughs> So our three speakers are going to give us two to three minutes of, from their perspective, what did they see, and how can we support gender-sensitive, resilient strategies going forward? So first of all, do we have Linda Gale online now? Okay, so let's hear from Linda Gale first. Thanks, Kate, and a huge honor and pleasure again to be with the interest uh, group and, and apologies that I'm online um, as opposed to be in person. I look forward to next year um, being right there with everyone again as we move towards, I think, our new uh, normal. Um, so, Kate, such an important topic and, uh, you know, I have been actually quite privileged here in South Africa to be in a situation where um, there are a number of strong women in science, and here I want to particularly pay tribute to Glenda Gray, my very good colleague, um, you know, who heads up the South African Medical Research Council. And, um, you know, I've been lucky to be in that sort of circle. Similarly, uh, Koleka Milasani would be another important name to bring to the fore who's leading up, leading up the MAC, the, the Ministerial Advisory Committee for the South African government around COVID, um, and, and others who are, you know, 
similar generation and similar gender who, who have actually led a lot of the work. Um, the comment I want to make is that I very much see now the importance, and I want to encourage other women in, in positions similar to mine, to ensure that we do bring the next generation up, um, that we look for opportunities for our, our fellow women to take these roles and responsibilities, make sure we are at, in positions where we are able to influence this sort of thing. So, you know, I, I think my biggest role now as I move into this next era of my career is actually to play my part in ensuring that um, women are, are at the table and are making very important contributions. I think Kate, you alluded to the fact that often we are the, uh, the part of the community that is doing the caring, uh, the, you know, the softer um, skills, if you like. Uh, but those skills are not to be undervalued. They are just as important. And it's not to say we don't in, you know, make huge contributions on the hard skills, the science, the, the competition, the being there. But I think if those soft skills, particularly at the time of crisis, if those soft skills are not there, then the world is not in its optimal position in terms of, of managing uh, these crises. So I think, you know, it's been important to see the role of women through COVID-19. Um, and I think more than ever before, that, that influence, that important role uh, was, was critical to see. So uh, I'll stop there just to, you know, having made those points that one, I think women need to be out there for other women, that two, the, the nuance we bring to the, to the situation is absolutely key and critical. Um, and then to say that you know, I think I'm in a really lucky position here in South Africa, but I think we can be using this, using this position to influence um, other settings, other situations. Thank you, Linda Gale. And I didn't introduce, these are three stellar women. They have very long biographies in the book. <laughs> uh, Linda Gale, you no doubt will recognize as the former president of the International AIDS Society, and she is the director of the Desmond Tutu HIV Center at the University of Cape Town. So I'd like to go next to Rhoda Wenyenze, who is uh, dean, professor and dean at the School of Public Health at uh, Murray University for uh, some comments from your perspective. Okay. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Kate. Uh, a good afternoon to you all, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So um, from my perspective, uh, thinking about the effects of uh, COVID on professional women, uh, especially women in, in, in science. I think uh, um, this has happened on various fronts. Uh, first, uh, as Linda mentioned, we, a, a lot of other responsibilities emerged, juggling uh, you know, uh, a lot of family, as well as um, you know, work-related challenges. We, especially women, the younger women that still have younger families, uh, struggled quite a bit. Uh, for us here in Uganda, with the lockdown of our schools and uh, many of our children studying online, we had uh, many mothers uh, homeschooling children, uh, either themselves or otherwise supporting them to do uh, online teaching. And, and, and for me, working with many women, uh, the majority of people I work with are women uh, in my school, especially on research projects, you realize that we, we, we just adjusted to a child coming in and saying, mommy, can I say hello to your friends? when you're actually in the midst of a meeting. And at one point we had a colleague moderating a meeting. It was, a, it was an international meeting. And then the child came and said, mommy, can I have a bottle of milk? And uh, then everybody went quiet, but then someone stepped in very easily and said, Hey, that's okay, mommy can get you milk, I will continue to moderate the session. So we got used to a lot of challenges uh, and, and issues, and we had to adjust 
focus on outputs rather than time uh, when somebody starts and when they end. And, and we had to build in a, a lot of flexibilities. But, but I also need to speak about one issue that we rarely don't uh, talk about, which is the gender-based violence, which is the silent pandemic. We often think it affects the women uh, who are at the lowest levels, but it's surprising just how much it happens around us and, uh, and, and how many of our colleagues are actually struggling with some of these challenges. And, and, and because we don't think about it and they don't talk about it freely, it's something we don't always recognize. And, and, and for me, it's just woken me up recently when I came face to face with it, uh, with someone who was really smart and all of a sudden they are not performing and everybody is concerned. We thought this person has lost interest. And, and at some point people thought, oh, perhaps we should be looking for someone else. But when she opens up to speak, then it's actually issues uh, of uh, gender-based violence that's severe and happening almost on a daily. And uh, I guess it got worse because uh, she's been spending a lot of time at home. So, so we need to be conscious of all these issues that are happening around us. And, and this is happening um, uh, over a lot of other challenges that we struggle with. Uh, because for us in academia, um, we always have challenges with involvement of women uh, generally. Um, uh, Linda just talked about issues of promotion. Often they are tied to you know, having a PhD, like for us in Makerere, if you don't have a PhD, you won't be promoted uh, beyond a certain level. So they have to do this, and, and sometimes they have to go away for a long time. So you find that they either delay to start, they delay to finish, and, and it got worse with COVID because uh, then the travels were interrupted and people's research was interrupted. For us here in Uganda, for almost a year, uh, there was a time when we could not do startup new studies that was stopped and then ongoing studies were interrupted. So I actually got face to face with my colleagues who were on their PhD studies stagnating and they could not progress uh, simply because of, of some of these lockdowns and a lot of challenges. So, so a number of issues are happening both on the work front as well as um, at home. And, and I think we need a lot of uh, uh, comprehensive support programs, uh, encouragement to be able to uh, support fellow women to move forward. And, and perhaps just to add um, from my own experience, um, um, I don't have too much time to share all the details, but I've just been chairing a committee um, for my university to review the gender equity terrain. And uh, uh, a lot of issues, again, emerging both from the home front, the, uh, a lot of household chores, you know, looking after the children, and then there are a lot of social cultural issues, and, and then there are the issues around um, the criteria for promotion. I actually think it needs to change because I don't think it always brings out the best when we are just counting and counting numbers without necessarily looking deeper in the quality and the spread of all the responsibilities within an academic environment, including teaching and mentorship and, and you know, focusing on that in a broader range. But, but I will just also add that um, uh, when there is a focused um, attention and encouragement that you can actually change the terrain and, and we should all try, uh, both the men and women uh, in this room and online. Um, using my own example in my school, um, for decades we did not even have a female head of department. I would actually say more than 20 years until I came in as the dean. But I thought, no, we have to change this. And I have deliberately been encouraging my colleagues to speak up. Uh, if they are in meetings, you go to call upon them. If there is opportunity for leadership, you go to push them. And, and when you do and when you encourage them and actually emphasize the positive aspects and attributes they have, they actually step forward. So right now, three of our heads of departments in my school out of four are actually women, and they are actually doing an excellent job. So we can actually change uh, the opportunities for women when we are focused and when we encourage them and support them in a comprehensive way. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Lots of food for thought there. So I'll move now to our local co-chair, Sabrina Bekira Taka, to give us some words. Uh, thank you very much, Kate. And I apologize I was late because we had a lunchtime meeting. So I'll give you two examples of my interaction with COVID-19. The first one was a health-related one. 
a um, friend of mine tested positive for COVID and she called me and said, girl, I tested positive for COVID and we sit next to each other literally, so you better go and test. And psychologically, I became ill immediately. <laughs> my, SO, my SPO2 was 88, my blood pressure shot up, and I was convinced I had COVID-19. Before my family understood what was going on, I had called the ambulance and I had packed my suitcase because those days, if you tested positive for COVID, you were locked up in a health facility. So my husband came in and said, why are you packing your clothes? And I said, because I'm going to the hospital, I think I have COVID-19. <laughs> and so the ambulance came in very shortly and they bundled me up into the back of the ambulance and I kept imagining, is this how real patients struggle with COVID-19? Without any support, without anyone to emotionally speak to you? And okay, my family was following at the back. And we got to the hospital, and I kept checking my oxygen sats. It was 90, and then 88, and then 92. I was really scared. <laughs> When I got to the hospital, I met with one of my former students who's a medical officer, and he told me to sit and settle down, and he rechecked my oxygen sats, and there were 98. And the first person who said she cannot be admitted was my husband, because I had to go back home and make dinner. <laughs> and he said, I promise I am going to make sure I take good care of you if you have COVID, because I think it's psychological. <laughs> and they did the swab and said they'd send me the results the following day, which turned out negative. So women, we are quite emotional, and that's the truth. The other, other story I want to share with you is I was going to defend my PhD in 2020, and my entire family was so excited, we were going to, excited, we were going to fly to Belgium, have a holiday, oh my goodness, and then COVID came. Oh no. So we couldn't travel. The defense had to be online, but I still made sure my family was happy, they celebrated me, but we missed a trip to Belgium. I haven't traveled for two years, and it makes me sad. I'd like to travel because I love to travel, but that's not the key issue. Today we are talking about supporting gender-sensitive, resilient strategies for women particularly. We know that the debate involving gender and professions has traditionally proceeded along a single line, one dimension. Many people ask questions. Is this woman able to satisfy the vocational demands? Can she actually do so without you know, compromising her fundamental values and identities? And indeed, yes, we have seen that women have risen up the ranks. Professor Roda here is a, a dean, and many of you are in your respective capacities moving up the ranks. However, women, we still have to attain the greatest position of power. We still need to get to that part. Here in interest, we do celebrate the many um, conference chairs, and I want to celebrate you, Kate, for being the previous interest co-chair. Well done. <laughs> but if you look at the balance, it's not actually balanced. And Linda, you have been the president of the IAS. We do celebrate you. But if you count on the number of, you know, between 1 to 10, I, I guess you all know the drill, isn't it? So in COVID-19, we know that there were many professionals who are struggling with lockdowns and all. But professionals come from various levels. You know, the high professionals who are called essential workers, and then those who actually service the industries. I want to say that as high, a high-functioning professional, I suffered the brunt of COVID-19 because one, my hairdresser couldn't go to work, the nails person couldn't go to work, and so we had to resolve <laughs> and learn new skills. And that is a very important thing. COVID-19 created a VUCA situation. It's volatile, uncertain, complex, and even ambiguous. And it is true that a lot of the COVID-19 hesitancy is driven by a lot of false misinformation and conversations. 
And I don't want to say that maybe it's women who talk a lot, but we have a lot of time, especially if we are locked out of our jobs, to pass on a message, a WhatsApp message which you haven't referred to properly, and that's a real problem. So nearly two years down the road, as we look at this unprecedented situation of COVID-19, it's important for us to appreciate that even post-COVID, we need to remain resilient. And how are we going to be resilient? We need to support each other. We need to support the other genders. We also need to support other people to be resilient. But we cannot do that if we have burnout. And today I want to encourage each and every one of us in this room to say no to burnout. Burnout presents like malaria, it, high fever, sometimes headache, weakness. But you've been walking around the clock. And we've had so many Zoom meetings. At one point, I didn't want to see another Zoom link because we were totally exhausted. And so please take care of yourselves. I am a student of self-care. And I think it's important that all of us push for self-care. Take time to look at the lake. Take time to breathe. Take time to listen to music. And take time to be resilient so that you too can make other people resilient. Now, the feminization of poverty and the gender-based violence is continuous. It's not going to stop today. But this global pandemic has taught us that if we have internal resilience, we can surmount any challenge. Thank you. I'll stop here for now. Thank you. I think in addition to our time on the clock, we have five minutes for questions. Is that correct? OK, so I'm just going to ask people in the room if they want to make a comment or ask a question. I just want to highlight while I'm waiting to see hands go up. One of the things I'd like to say is I want to call on the men here, whether you are fathers or grandfathers, to play a role when you get into dealing with homeschooling and homework and so on, to share that load. <laughs> you know, you don't have to be a woman to be a feminist to want to promote women for gender equity and equality. So you can all do that. Okay, number two, number one, is, do we do it by number? Okay, number one. Please just introduce yourself and what country you're from and your question or comment. My name is Roger Sewunya, I'm from Uganda. I would like, first of all, to thank the panelists. I think my question goes to any. What would be the advice to men in terms of the best way to support our wives or our fellow sisters amidst their career aspirations. Because they need to balance, satisfy the home needs, but also need the career. How best would they advise the men here, including myself? That's a great question. I'm going to ask Linda Gale to respond, but I would say the first thing is to listen. And <laughs> <laughs> Linda Gale. And the second, the second thing, Kate, is to help. <laughs> um, you know, I, 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 it's a great question, and thank you. I, I appreciate that it was even asked and asked by a man. I, I think that shows incredible, um, you know, sort of willingness to, to contribute. Uh, um, my, there's one word that pops into my mind when I hear this, and I think Rhoda already said the word, it's flexibility. I think the most important thing that help women in their careers is to approach it with a flexible uh, viewpoint. Each woman's journey is gonna be slightly different. My story is that I ended up only being able to have one child because I, I did all my academia before I, I, I realized that my biological clock was sort of moving on. Um, <laughs> And you know that that was the choice that I made, uh, but it meant that um, you know that that was the situation. Now I do want to just expand a little bit on that because I think it's important to realise uh, that each individual is a very personal journey. My child had a diagnosis of a severe um, embryonic cancer at age eight months. So suddenly, for the next four years. I spent all my time at his bedside as he was given chemotherapy. Now there is a dad, but as you well know, 
dad and dad was willing to be helpful but when it comes to nurturance when children are sick there's n nobody better than mom um, in order to help there and I want to say that it was my colleagues and many of them women women who still work with me and I value greatly who stepped in to say we will hold the fort for you we will stand in there for you um, and help you get through this and you know thank God and thank everyone around uh, including Red Cross um, and biomedical technology M my son is now 20 and well um, and I have a career intact um, and that you know that just <laughs> think, epitomizes how we need flexibility in our systems so I think that is the most key ingredient whether it comes from the people employing us the people in our homes the people in our circle to to really adapt to the needs of the individual sometimes and i think you know it's been said that phd might take five years rather than three years again i think there needs to be support and adaptability around being able to enable that um, so that would be my key ingredient that i would throw out kate to begin with Thank you. We have a minute and a half. We have two questions or comments, n number two and then number three. Thank you so much uh, for the, um, the presentation. I just have a comment um, in as far as um, supporting women to get up there. Um, my proposition and suggestion is that uh, if there are any mentorship, women-focused mentorship platforms, I think it would be good to make sure that as many as possible uh, young women that are trying to grow their careers get exposed to these platforms where our seniors are, and I mean senior women in the career world, so that they can um, easily hold the hands of the juniors and help them to move up the ladder. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent suggestion. Number three. Hi, I'm Nadia Samagudu from um, the Institute of Human Virology in Nigeria. So I, I just wanted to comment and talk. Hi, Linda Gale. Um, I just wanted to comment and, and, uh, on this as well. Um, you know, I ran a, a similar uh, panel for um, on women in science and before COVID at the Nigerian um, Implementation Science Alliance, and we had panelists like that talking about you know how women can you know get their careers in, in science and not drop out. But I realized that not one single panelist in talking about solutions mentioned anything to do with the men that we are partnered with. All of the solutions were outside of talking about what men could and should do. And I think we, we have to get to that uncomfortable place. And because a lot of the things that do not allow us to move forward have to do with um, um, relationships with men or being you know, mothers or being wives, um, um, you usually do not see that much of a dip with women who are single. Okay, and I've been, I've been mentoring women who are single who once they get married, it's gone. It's gone. You know, they, 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 they feel that they are not doing their life you know, a service if they continue in the research, and they drop off. And for someone who mentors a lot of women, it's really sad to see that. So I know that myself, I, you know, I try to give that example of, of my own partnership, and, and I'm, and I'm you know, both lucky and both um, very focused on making sure that I'm able to be, I've been married for 21 years. But I've, I've made a lot of progress scientifically, and my husband has been an integral part of that. You know, um, um, uh, he bought me my, a cake when I got my first RO1. He will sleep on the couch while I'm staying up all night working in solidarity. He will ask me if he can help with my PowerPoint presentations, etc., etc. So these are things that really help me. And when I sit at my laptop on my work desk and I open my laptop, the household knows that you don't come and ask me anything unless you're bleeding. So th th those are some of the things that help me. So uh, please, let's, we need more examples of this and we need more to, to include men and those other um, roles that we are expected to play. We need to talk about that and we have to have structural change um, so that uh, this, this can happen. Thank you.
Thank you. We can't go to number four, I'm afraid, because we're already two minutes over. I really want people to continue this conversation throughout the rest of the conference mm -hmm. with, your, with your colleagues, with your experiences. So it's partly, you know, asking women in a meeting for their opinion. It's what we do at home. It's what we do at work. I have to just conclude by saying that, you know, I was co-chair, I was the scientific chair for five years and always wanting to have a woman who would be the local chair. And that happened once with Dr. Shiru in Cameroon. And so for 2020, I said, that's it, that's all. From now on, we're having two local co-chairs. One will be a man, one will be a woman. That's the only way. These little steps are what take us forward. So thank you to a superb panel, and please do keep these conversations going.